We have three speakers, and I'll introduce them each before they come up. But let me do the first one, and that's Vince Smith. Uh, Vince is professor of economics in the Department of Agricultural Economics and Economics at Monta Montana State University and co-director of MSU's Agricultural Marketing Policy Center. Uh, Vince is a visiting AEI scholar, and he's been the director of AEI's Agricultural Policy Initiative for some years now. I don't know how many years. Um, he's also no stranger to, to IFPRI. As many of you uh, probably know, Vince uh, uh, worked from 2012-2015 uh, as a visiting scholar with IFPRI uh, down in the production thing with Mark Rosegrant, right? Uh, and. Um, any event, Vince has written extensively on crop insurance and commodity policy and a number of things. Um, and he's going to talk today about crop insurance. Uh, um, it's really a pleasure to come back to IFPRI. I've, I've worked with uh, EPTD for many years and still continue to work with Alex DePinto on climate change issues. Uh, so ver very much appreciate being here. Um, just before I get started, I have this naive view of what is good and bad policy, but particularly bad policy. Policies that waste resources and give money to wealthy people on average, I don't think are very good. In fact, I think they're pretty not good at all. And this is what you'll see as a theme throughout each of these discussions. Um, I'm going to want to f I focus on uh, agricultural insurance because U.S. programs are often held up in the agricultural insurance world as the blue chip stellar example of good policy, and they are anything but that. Um, they're, they're viewed that way because so many farmers, 90% or close to 90% of all eligible acreage in the U.S. is insured, and that's viewed as a good thing. But the question is, how do you get there, why do you get there, and who really is benefiting from these programs? Standard economic questions. Um, almost all of the program's expansion since the early 1980s when less than 15 percent of insurable land was insured under the programs established during the Great Depression years uh, have been driven by increasingly substantial subsidies. And I'll show you a picture in a few minutes that represents that. The program's existence in its current form is only sustained because the government effectively pays 70 percent of the actual cost of the average policy. And farmers basically are going to make money over the longer run buying crop insurance. It's, it's not a risk management tool per se, it's an income enhancement tool. Uh, and anyone who tells you differently has been smoking hemp, which is now is apparently legal. Um, <laughs> uh, farm businesses do simply not buy multiple peril crop insurance or even index insurance, at least in, in the current environment, if they actually have to pay the commercial cost of the insurance. And the reason is simple because, as Hans Binswanger noted many times, they have a multitude of ways of managing risk, whether, you, whether they're a farm in Kenya or Bangladesh or in Iowa. Uh, and the, those ways are cheaper and more efficient than buying crop insurance at the full cost, even if you're just self-insuring. Because you're going to have to pay another 50 percent uh, on top of what is needed to pay your indemnities in the form of uh, an additional charge to cover a and costs, even in a competitive insurance market. It's just the way it is. Uh, and in fact, in the U.S., we have some resource use issues. Uh, subsidized crop insurance encourages farmers to actually adopt high-risk production practices that waste resources because taxpayers cover their losses, just as was the case in the mortgage crises of the 1980s. The, sorry, the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s and the mortgage crisis effectively of 2006 to 8. Um, and, and they cause farms to expand production on fragile lands. Um, farm businesses right now under the current structure of the program with current crop prices, which are more moderate than they were uh, a few years ago, uh, receive an average of about $5.6 billion a year in what are called premium subsidies. And that's 62 percent of the total full premium to cover uh, indemnity payments uh, price of the insurance. Um, about 81 percent of the money goes to the largest 20 percent of farms. And over 65 percent of the money goes to the largest 10 percent of farms. These are farms with net worths uh, 
in excess of six million, seven million dollars a year. They're mid-sized companies, agribusiness firms, uh, even though they're often couched as family farms, uh, which they may be, or not as the case may be. On average, for every dollar a farm business owner in fact puts into the insurance program, they get back more than two dollars, about two dollars and eleven cents, I think is, is a number that Joe Glauber has shared with us. Um, that's over a hundred percent average return on their investment. Um, crop insurance companies and reinsurance companies are given an average of about two point five billion dollars a year out of the premium funds to manage the programs. That makes this an expensive way, even for the US government, of transferring income. It's pretty expensive. Uh, it's, it's close to 50 cents on the dollar. Um, USDA spends an additional mere $80 million to $100 million administering the program and funding research and education programs to help farmers understand what is also an absurdly complex program. Um, just to give you some pictures, uh, this is a picture put together by a, a couple of my colleagues and I that's uh, in the book. Um, the, uh, the blue line is fascinating. It, it, the blue columns show you subsidies per acre. So the bigger the farm, the more subsidies per acre they get. And it's a lot more. It's a stunning number. They get about uh, three times as much as a farm in the 40 to 50 percent range of crop sales. There are all sorts of reasons for this we haven't got time to discuss. But in addition, of course, all of the payments are located, that's the red column, um, they're located in the upper 10, 20 percent of, of the uh, operations in terms of crop sales. This is a rich man's program, not a poor, uh, hard scrabble farmer's program. If you farm on a Native American uh, reservation in, in the West, or you're operating a very small farm in Mississippi, Mississippi uh, as a minority, um, you're not getting anything out of this program. Uh, it's not for the poor, it's for the rich. And just to indicate how program growth has occurred, which I mentioned earlier, in 1981, less than 20% of all land was insured in this program. Um, 1983, 30% subsidies were introduced. Um, and the program grew a bit, but not that rapidly to, to close to, uh, so by 94, you've got about 30% of insurable acreage um, insured. 94 is a watershed, subsidies were substantially increased to about 45% of the actuarially fair premium. Um, and then you see a big bump up. Um, and then in 2000, we had further increase in subsidies under uh, uh, something called ARPA, which sounds like a dirty carpet, but that's never mind. It's called the Agricultural Risk Protection Act. Uh, and now we are averaging uh, the US government paying 62% of the premium charge to the farmer and an additional substantial amount goes to the companies to administer the program. Um, these show what has happened. This figure just shows uh, government expenditures on premium subsidies and administration and operation subsidies. Those are the subsidies going to the crop insurance companies. And very little was spent uh, all the way through 1994 when Barry Goodwin and I wrote a book on crop insurance. Uh, we were spending about half a billion dollars a year in subsidies for farmers and for the crop insurance company. About half the money went to the farmers in subsidy and half went to the, the crop, to crop insurance companies. Um, and then after 94, with a substantial increase in subsidies to farmers, the program spending exploded. Um, it peaked in 2011 and 12 because crop prices for the major insured commodities, corn, wheat, and so on, also peaked in that period. And the higher the price of wheat or corn, the larger the dollar amount of subsidy that's going to go to the farmer. It's just the way the program is set up. Um, and, um, and so now we're at this seven and a half, eight billion dollars a year uh, amount being spent on, on direct subsidies. And in some years, you can have much higher levels of subsidy because of major crop losses. And the government bears a disproportionate share of covering losses in this program compared to the, the companies. Um, uh, uh, th this figure shows loss ratios. The total loss ratio 
is the ratio of total out payments to farmers relative to the amount that farmers pay into the program. Does that make sense? So that, those loss ratios have, except for one year since 1981, been substantially above one. Farmers get more out of the program than they pay in, and in some years it has been as high as four or three and a half. Uh, so for every dollar on average that was paid in by a farmer, four dollars came back to the agricultural sector directly. Um, the other loss ratio is the producer loss ratio, which is the number that the USDA likes to report, which shows loss ratios, total payments into insurance pools. So that's what the farmer puts in what, plus what the government puts in relative to payouts. And from that perspective, the program is close to actuarially sound or actuarially sound. The loss ratio is a little bit less than one on, on average. But that's not the loss ratio that matters from a, a real policy perspective. It, from a marketing of the program perspective, yes, but not from a policy perspective. Um, we have a goal. So what, wh where are the real costs lying? Well, in something called the Harvest Price Option Revenue Insurance Product, which is a, a Cadillac insurance product. And I haven't got time to run through this in detail. Essentially, it basically says if prices go up, and you have moderate yields, you're going to get paid. And if prices go down, and if you have moderate yields, you're going to get paid even more. Um, th this program is designed to cater to corn growers, soybean growers, and wheat growers. Um, heavily pays out uh, and is used at a very intense level by, by those guys. And by the way, those three crops get 70% of all crop insurance subsidy payments. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go through all the details there because literally I've got 58, sec 58 seconds to sort of wrap up. Um, revenue programs which came in in 1994 have surged since then and they are the preferred option if available for almost all insurance products. They're only available for crops that have viable futures markets or uh, prices that are closely linked to those markets. Um, um, here's the other big issue here. R huge winners from this program are the, fa are the private crop insurance companies, the crop insurance agents, and the reinsurance companies. Though their revenues um, have been substantial. Even in 2012, where we had very substantial losses in the program, this was the only year other than 1992, which was also a major catastrophe year, uh, where, net rev where revenues to the insurance companies were negative. And what is fascinating is that if we look at underwriting gains and losses, whether or not there's a profit in the pool or, or a loss in the insurance pool, the government, that's the orange line, when there are losses, takes care of most of the losses. The companies get most of the gains when there are underwriting gains, when, when there are positive returns from the insurance pool. Um, so what do you want to do with this? Get rid of the program would be my real recommendation. Waste resources, uh, shovels money to relatively wealthy people, has all the earmarks of a policy that I would not vote for if it were for, say, um, uh, fish hooks, uh, uh, producers. Um, it should be gone. Uh, what else could we do? Well, can the worst parts of the program, the harvest, this harvest price option Cadillac program, uh, was recommended for dissolution by several members of Congress over the last three years. Um, uh, could roll back subsidies to pre-2000 levels, at least that would save some money and reduce the transfers may that go to the relative wealthy farms. Um, there's a particular program that Dr. Goodwin, who's going to talk about other stuff, um, uh, will, will, uh, has made seminal contributions to called preventive planting. This is subject to fraud, waste, and abuse and is impossible to regulate effectively. Should go. Um, um, you could cap premium subsidies on a farm basis, say at 40000 a year. That's only roughly twice the poverty line for a family of four. Um, uh, in other words, this is a program that I would argue at least remains substantively in disarray and has been pristinely left untouched by the current farm bill. So thank you. And, uh,